Hello, good evening and welcome. I'm Karima Brown and you're watching Political Exchange where we unpack Africa's political economy. Tonight my guest is EU Ambassador Roland de Geer. He of course is in charge of EU South Africa relations which has a lot on the calendar and we're going to be unpacking some of the trade and political issues that defines the relationship between the bloc and South Africa. Uh, Mr. de Geer or Ambassador de Geer, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Very much. Now just quickly, um, um, take us through some of the major events that are coming up. We know that there's an intense round of discussions at various levels between uh, EU uh, delegations at government and, and official level. Yes. Uh, just take us through some of the most important ones that are coming up in the next few weeks. Yes. Well, if you allow me to um, uh, make one quick step back and to say that we've just had a very successful summit between South Africa and the European Union with our presidents Barroso and Van Rompuy here in South Africa being received by President Zuma. And um, as an indication of how close our ties are at the moment, President Zuma received our presidents on Madiba's 95th uh, birthday. And we were very touched by that extra um, gesture of the South African government. I think uh, the summit set, um, the t consolidated, uh, but also set the tone um, for a new round of intensive, as you already indicated yourself, consultations between South Africa and the European Union. Uh, we are both very active in the region, uh, on the continent. Um, the uh, relations between the African Union and the European Union are close. But South Africa is also very active in the multilateral framework in the UN, we know South Africa's interest to play a more important role in the UN framework. So we have all these political uh, consultations going on at the moment where we exchange views and where we consult with each other. At the same time, um, we uh, both are confronting an economic crisis. We are both hit by the um, worldwide crisis. And we both feel that uh, just a bit more growth would uh, greatly facilitate our internal reform processes. In the case of South Africa, of course, um, the whole transformation process would be greatly uh, helped by a bit more growth. And as you can imagine in the European Union, a bit more growth would uh, substantially reduce our uh, unemployment uh, and specifically our youth unemployment, which in some European countries is now at South African levels. Mm -hmm. So on all these issues, we are working very close together. Now, there were some very tough discussions, of course, at the summit, very frank, very robust discussions. Yes, yes. One of the issues, of course, was the issue around the BITs. Yes, and there yes. was um, quite a kind of loud um, you know, response from the EU yes. at a political level around yes. process around how the matter was handled yes. and of course security around uh, foreign investments in South Africa is a critical issue yes. take us through how the matter has been resolved yes. and what indications you've gotten from Minister Rob Davies South Africa's trade minister around uh, the legislative uh, you know securities that are going to be put in place um, that will put um, to rest some of the concerns of European investors yes yes Karima in the first place um, South Africa remains, let me be very clear here, for the European Union, and we've made that very clear, a very good investment destination. And as you know, by far the majority of FDI today <coughs> still comes from the European Union, and the stock is, 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 is very big, it's well over 70%. So <coughs> in principle, that relation is stable. In the second place, and I would like to underline that also very much here in public, of course, that the European Union has always said South Africa, of course, will <coughs> have to decide itself how it protects international investment. So these two things are the basis for how we look at what has happened. At the same time, of course, we have uh, expressed our concern about, <coughs> as you already indicated, process. These uh, decisions uh, were taken, they were taken rather rapidly and they were not taken on the basis of consultations. And of course it's a South African decision, but investment 
very much depends on a climate of confidence. And if you take one-sided uh, measures, even if you have the full right to do that, there is always a feeling of uneasiness. Not so much maybe um, amongst diplomats, but we felt very much uh, obliged to express this because um, we felt that we um, needed also to speak on behalf of the investors in a way. At the same time, um, we should not um, overdo things. Um, South Africa and the European Union are looking at this issue. A number of BITs have in the meantime, uh, have bilateral investment treaties have in the meantime, th we, we've received annunciation that they will be revoked. Uh, but we are looking at the whole picture at the moment. And South Africa, as you know, has said we are preparing legislation to uh, properly protect uh, foreign investment and of course uh, you should also realize there is a lot of confidence in the business community in South Africa's existing framework. So there is no crisis but we felt obliged to say don't take these measures in that way without consultation. Some uh, analysts have suggested that perhaps the manner in which you raised the issue that you shot yourself in the foot um, and that it might have um, get gotten the South African uh, authorities' back up, particularly if one considers that the revoking of some of those agreements didn't necessarily impact on investment if you look at, for example, independent power producers. Um, Ambassador, were there queries from investors to yourselves about what the revoking of these BITs would mean? And um, have we seen any negative impact as a consequence of that um, you know, process? There were many queries, but at the same time, as we have always said, we do not see um, this in itself as a reason to expect that investments will decrease. However, um, there have been concerns by companies and um, our very strong reaction, which we think was absolutely needed, and, and you know, we will do it uh, again if, if needed, but was very much on the process. I think that, that was extremely important. Uh, you should realize that in other cases we don't have BITs. For instance, uh, to give an example, uh, uh, in Brazil we don't have BITs. So we are, we are not saying there is no life after BITs. What we are saying is if you change the very sensitive regulations relating to foreign uh, investment, do it very carefully. But as you say, we are at the moment in a, in, in, in a positive, forward-looking mood. And I think that um, the relations between South Africa and the European Union are stable, they're wide and deep, and if these things happen, then South Africa or the European Union should also feel free, you know, within limitations, you know, uh, to, to say what we think. And, and I think this has been appreciated by South Africa as well in the end. Now, of course, a lot of the political interaction is underpinned by very robust, very intense trade negotiations, yes, yes. Um, some of uh, which have gone on for quite a protracted yes. and long period yes, of time. Yes, so I know diplomats don't like to be asked about time frames, but I am going to push you a little bit on the EPA time, fr EPA, uh, tr uh, time frames. Um, there is an indication that there would be a con Conclusion of the uh, discussions and that we'd see some indication of, of substantial progress yes. by the end of the year. Can you just take us through that and what we're likely to expect? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, let, me, let me underline, of course, that the negotiations between the European Union and the southern part of SADC, South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, Namibia, Angola and Mozambique, are between true groups of countries, which means uh, that they are complex and that they require um, consultations. And that is why it has taken quite some time, as you said. Uh, I think we all, Southern Africa and the European Union, think it has taken too much time, but this there where we stand. And our aim at the moment uh, is, that's our compass needle, the direction of our compass needle, is to come to a substantive agreement this year, in 2013, which means that we don't have a long time anymore. 
Uh, our trade commissioner, de Gucht, uh, will come to South Africa uh, over the next few weeks. And I can say that there is a very strong commitment within the European Union to come to a conclusion. And my feeling is, uh, on the basis of many discussions that I've had with the South Africa and the countries in the region, that this political will also exists in Southern Africa. And, and a last point, of course, this is not just about trade. It's a broad economic partnership right. agreement. Now, there are some non-negotiables, obviously, for EU countries in this economic partnership agreement. Um, you have expressed concern around things like econ uh, geographic indicators. You've got expressed concern around things like, um, you know, taxes. Um, take us through what are kind of non-negotiables uh, for the EU, considering that everything is on the table. But what is it that you'd like to get out um, and that um, your member state is certainly going to you know, hold your negotiators yes. to? Yeah. L let, me, um, uh, let me confirm what you're saying, that you know, everything has been on the table. On the geographical information, I, I would like to underline this. It's not so much that it was an non-negotiable. We, we find it important that uh, South African and Southern African products are protected in our big markets and at the same time of course we would be very pleased if our products were protected in the Southern African market. But it has not been a non-negotiable, it has something that we have proposed and that took some time to be accepted because it's quite complex. But uh, I've traveled extensively through Europe over the past two uh, weeks. And to see, for example, how widely accepted rooibos now is, it's, it's amazing. And I think it's extremely important that rooibos is well protected. Uh, and of course, uh, we do also have a number of products that we would like uh, to see protected. So that, that, that's well. Uh, apart from that, um, we've had um, uh, uh, long discussions uh, and detailed discussions, uh, of course, on tariffs, market access, uh, and on trade-related uh, issues as better administrative um, facilities and so on. So, um, as I said, we are approaching the end. Uh, I don't think there are any uh, issues at the moment that un are unsurmountable. And uh, when I look once more, as, as you already mentioned, the GIs, the market access, um, the tariff lines, um, um, on all these progress has been very substantial. Uh, it's now a matter of bringing it all together and then say, do we have a good balance? Not only for the European Union and South Africa, because as you know, between us, South Africa and the European Union, we have the TDCA, which is a good deal right. for both of us. But now we want to expand it in the region, and we are also thinking about the smaller partners, Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, Namibia. Mr. Ambassador, um, apart from the trade uh, relations between South Africa and the EU, there's of course um, uh, a very you know, big political uh, relationship and interaction. You often refer to South Africa as your main um, and most strategic partner on the continent. Let's start with the latest news around uh, what the um, continent has been uh, busy with. Um, over the weekend, the African Union uh, came together to discuss, of course, the uh, fact that the Kenyan president and vice president uh, stand indicted at the International Criminal Court. Um, and of course, subsequent to the Nairobi siege, there is the sense from African leaders, one, that the ICC is preoccupied with, with, with Africa as opposed to, to other members of, of the ICC or signatories, and that perhaps um, there should be a different uh, relationship, particularly around sitting presidents. The EU has always emphasized the issue of human rights. Um, it's a very key part of your foreign policy. I don't imagine that you are happy with the sentiments coming out of the AU. Let me in the first place confirm what you're saying, that for the European Union, human rights and international justice, impunity, transitional justice is extremely important. And against that background, of course, there is strong support for the ICC in Europe. But let me underline that there is also very strong support for the ICC 
throughout Africa. In the establishment of the ICC, African states have played a major role. More than 30 were in the first wave uh, establishing the ICC. In addition, my personal experience in the Great Lakes region, where I worked for four years, has been that the governments in the region are on the whole very positive um, about the ICC. And I also would like to underline that all cases from Africa that are um, being uh, dealt with by the ICC are on the basis of the governments themselves having handed over these people or the UN with, 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 with full consent. So in reality, in reality, the cooperation between Africa and the ICC is going quite well. Mm -hmm. But there have been some highly visible cases uh, of precedence, and of course, in the case of Kenya, things came together. So whereas the Kenyan president and vice president have said, we will cooperate with the ICC, um, many African leaders felt this, this, this is getting too much at the same time. Uh, that has been expressed in, um, in, in Addis. Um, uh, there has been a, a general feeling in Addis that the ICC should not deal with governing presidents. And the AU has specifically commented on the fact that the Kenyan uh, leadership at the moment um, should, should, should not be burdened with an ICC case. Um, we think the political signal uh, of the AU fully supporting the ICC is important and that signal of course has been has been muted there is no no doubt about it but at the same time um, the feeling that that there was uh, in some circles that the AU would really take its distance mm -hmm. from uh, the um, ICC th that's not the case at all in fact um, we have seen a strong support for the principle of international justice and the principle of impunity. So I think the outcome uh, is, is, is an ongoing relation with the ICC and of course the AU and the EU have very close and strong relations and this will of course be further on the agenda. <laughs> of course what precipitated this debate um, is the standoff between uh, Islamist groups um, in uh, Kenya with the Kenyan army yes. um, and we have seen in international relations ambassador uh, security concerns yes. trumping human rights. Uh, we've seen that um, in the case of big global players such as America with things like rendition and so on. Um, this call that the um, kind of security crisis in Kenya and in that East African region um, ought to trump uh, you know, processes that will bring justice to those um, against whom transgressions took place on a human rights level. What is the EU's view on weighing up these two issues, particularly in a global context where security concerns have become uh, so paramount um, in the way in which countries conduct themselves? Yes. Let me be, be, be very clear here. Of course, as you know, for the European Union, considerations of human rights and impunity are, are very, very of prime importance, there is no doubt about it. At the same time, uh, we, we have to be realistic and pragmatic, so we will have to see how these things should be weighed. And um, um, in, in general, um, of course, this is one of the key challenges that, that governments, international um, institutions, organizations and, and diplomats in them um, uh, have to face um, how to balance these differing policies and demands. The European Union, of course, uh, will, 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 will always, you know, the tendency will always be to move in as much as we can in the direction of human rights. That, that is how we stand, how we feel. We, we think that is very important. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in cases like Kenya, of course, we see what is happening and we have taken note, obviously, of the African Union uh, position. But of course, we are not the ICC. Yeah. Now, the Malawian government has, um, you know, 
been in the spotlight in recent days. President Joyce Banda has in fact fired her entire cabinet on allegations of, of corruption. Prior to her coming in, there was a very big push from European countries around uh, dealing with um, you know, corruption in, in, in Malawian society, but particularly in Malawi's, uh, Malawi's government. And a lot of aid um, was tied to um, you know, that consideration. What is the EU's reaction to uh, President Banda's, uh, what some would say, unprecedented uh, move um, against her cabinet? Yes. Of course, um, the EU is, is still, you know, it, it has just happened and is still considering this whole position. But on the whole, in general terms, I, I would like to confirm that um, the a drive in general, a, a drive against corrupt practices, is, is, is something that we look at as, as, as extremely important. I mean, corruption, quite frankly, means that people steal from the government budget. And if you do that for a number of years, the uh, effects on that budget are, are enormous. I mean, uh, often the word corruption, I find, is, is sort of a sort of blanket term which hides the fact that this is theft. And um, if I take the, the city where I was born, Amsterdam, I mean, I know very well that if every year 10 to 15 percent of that budget would just disappear, the city would be very severely affected. So this is the same everywhere. So in general, we do feel that rule of law, the struggle against uh, corruption is extremely important. The developments in Libya has also um, become quite complicated. Everybody thought that uh, getting rid of uh, Muammar Gaddafi would be um, the gateway to uh, democratization in Libya. What we've seen, of course, is the converse, intensified conflict, the country being broken up into sectarian groups. In fact, um, what many would argue that it is in fact now a lot more unstable than during the time of, of Muammar Gaddafi. Considering, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, mm -hmm. Ambassador, do you still think that the, the UN resolution was the right thing to do in Libya? Uh, more so if one looks at the way it impacted the European Union's relationship or NATO countries' relationship with African leaders. Yeah. Let me um, uh, start with the European Union. Um, um, Libya is on the African continent, but as you know, it's also a neighboring country for the European Union. I mean, the um, Mediterranean um, cooperation is extremely important, so we feel close to Libya. Well, it is literally on your doorstep, it isn't is it? It is literally. On the, we, we, in fact, we have a maritime border with Libya. So th I think that is an extremely important consideration. Um, there was a very serious concern about uh, a possible extremely uh, grave development of human rights situation in Libya. And there was a feeling uh, that we had to handle. Had we not handled and certain things would have happened, we would be in a very difficult situation today as well. Having said that, there is no doubt that the situation in Libya is extremely complicated and it continues to affect the European Union in a very direct way uh, and also in a dramatic way. You, you, you have seen what happened uh, around the Italian island of Lampudes. This is not for us a theoretical yes. problem, it's, it's a very close problem. So we share the concern. And we also feel that uh, the international community, which as you know is always uh, a difficult uh, 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 a concept to bring into direct action, but that we also as, as, as Europeans uh, should continue to play our active role and giving this, this, this priority because the situation, as you said, is far from stable. We have arrived at this situation. Uh, we have to accept that we are in this situation, but we feel extremely committed and close. And we do hope also that there, together with the African Union, we can march forward jointly in what will remain extremely complex. Mm -hmm. Now, South Africa is, of course, uh, playing quite a leading role in a series of international fora, yes, yes, yes. Um, but also particularly um, on the African continent, yes. and the EU is always looking to South Africa to yes. play that partnership role. Um, quickly, Ambassador, the kind of relationship between the EU and South Africa around 
flashpoints, as, as one would call it, let's say Zimbabwe, yes. Libya, um, and then even uh, further, you know, the question of Syria. There was a few months ago um, great dissonance between the two uh, um, around a common approach. Would you say that you are much closer now in terms of defining uh, joint ways of, of, of intervention in those countries and, and diplomatic outreaches to try and resolve what is often very complex situations? Yeah. Let me say this. We have a very robust consultative mechanism on everything. We've seen differences of opinion of, about Ivory Coast, about Libya, about Zim. Uh, at the same time, on all these issues, we have continued to consult in a very intensive way, including at the presidential level. And I think that uh, without suggesting that we agree on Ill all issues, uh, that on all issues we understand each other, we know what differences are, and on many issues our positions have grown uh, much nearer. Uh, I think on issues like Sudan, Somalia, uh, there, there is a great convergence, and as you said, and I would like to underline that, we do see South Africa obviously as, as a major partner on the continent, but there are others as well. I mean. Nigeria. Other big countries, Nigeria, Angola, Kenya, but others as well. And of course, for us, the African Union remains very much the sister organization uh, of the European Union. So we will always consult very closely with the African Union. Ambassador, thank you so very much. Always a pleasure to speak to you.